this is Europe. We still have a lot of convincing to do, but if we can get them to agree with us, then we can meet the goals. We have seen a banner year uh, in 2020 for sustainability. Uh, there is a threat of greenwashing. So if you're not sustainable today, but you want to be in business in 20 years' time, you've got to work on the sustainability agenda. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Thursday, the 15th of July. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and these is what our top stories are on today's program. Staying vigilant, Jay Powell says the Fed is ready to take action if prices get to too hot, but that it's too early to pare back stimulus. He faces more questions from the Senate today. In Europe, ECB board member Isabel Schnabel warns that inflation may return quicker than expected. We'll speak shortly with the Banca d'Italia governor, Ignazio Visco. And Player Two enters the game. Well, Bloomberg learns that Netflix is planning a push beyond TV and film. The company hires a former EA executive to lead its efforts into video gaming. So let's get straight to the top market stories. And of course, the Fed chair, Jay Powell, says it is still too soon to scale back the central bank's aggressive support for the U.S. economy. Facing the House Financial Services Committee as part of a two-day grilling, Powell stuck to his line. Inflation will be transitory. Now, he did also add that the debate amongst FMC members would continue. Inflation has increased notably and will likely remain elevated in coming months before moderating. Inflation is being temporarily boosted by base effects as the sharp pandemic-related price increases from last spring drop out of the 12-month 12 12 -month calculation. While reaching the standard of substantial further progress is still a ways off, participants expect that progress will continue, and we will continue these discussions in coming meetings. As we've said, we'll provide advance notice before announcing any decision to make changes to our purchases. It really is a very broad range of things, including wages, unemployment, levels of employment, participation, all those things. So, so we just said substantial further progress. And we also said that we would provide advance, advance notice you know, well in advance of actually tapering. Well, let's talk about the markets now with Bloomberg's Eddie van der Waalt. Uh, Eddie, when you look at inflation, what we heard from Jay Powell, what we also heard from BlackRock's Larry Fink, what exactly the market seems to be taking mm. on their strand, in their stride rather, and just looking at dollar levels. Absolutely. You know what? This has really been interesting, particularly those BlackRock comments. I think you've absolutely nailed it on the head because in BlackRock, BlackRock saying they 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 are seeing wage pressure and they they you know that they are pushing um, if, uh, wages up by eight percent, right, um, across the board for for their employees. Uh, but the Powell had an answer to that. Pla Powell said, "Listen, the supply pressure." in the labor market is going to start to soften in the coming months. And I think, you know, I think that is the big question for markets at the moment, because it's one thing to see uh, manufacturing inflation coming through and inflation, oil prices and all of these other things. It's quite a different thing to talk about the, the pressure that's coming from the labor market. And if and that is going to be the whole the real key to whether this is transitory or persistent. Eddie, we also had some data out of China. How important is that, given all the concerns we had on China and the fact that PBOC maybe had to support the economy? It feels like now they're steady and actually there won't be an extra, extra need for support from PBOC. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. It, it's hard to imagine that the PBOC didn't have an inkling of what these numbers are going to be before, you know, before before we saw them. So I think China is looking at these numbers and, it's, and they're really hard to unpick because there's the base effect and, you know, there's 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 a lot of things going on. But I think China is, is the other half of the discussion. There's been a lot of pressure coming on supply chains on the manufacturing side of economies. And particularly that was because during the, the coronavirus, people were at home. They didn't spend money on services. They didn't spend money on restaurants. They spent all their money on goods. And a lot of those goods come from China. That caused supply chain disruption and, and pushed up you know, prices uh, for, for manufacturers. Now we're seeing that starting to ease because people are starting to start to, to spend on services again. And I think that is the that's what we're seeing here. China, there's a pivot away from growth that is very reliant on China. So I'm not too worried. I think that could actually take some of the inflationary pressure off while at the same time not uh, hurt growth in the West too much. 
I'm looking at WTI, Eddie, and it's at just below $72 a barrel. What are we expecting from OPEC Plus? It seems that the UAE may actually fall into line with some kind of agreement with the Saudis. Mm, the OPEC the OPEC alliance stands strong, and I think that's really interesting. But what this is telling us, because if the UAE, if they are allowed, you know, to pump a little bit more um, because, you know, their baselines are mo being moved higher, then others come next year, come early next year, are going to push to, to pump more oil. Other members of the alliance are going to push to pump more oil. So I think what this is telling us is that in the short term, the OPEC alliance held strong. So so that kind of puts a cap on the amount of oil and the oil market will be able to absorb the amount that's flowing in in the short term. But come next year, it's going to be harder and harder to, you know, tell all the other members, listen, you've got to, you've got to pump as much as you did last year. So therefore, we're likely to see an increase in supply next year, which again, takes some of the pressure off the, you know, off, off pr price rises and off inflation. And potentially, I think that could just uh, help Powell in making the case that this is transitory going into next year. Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie van der Valt there from our M Live team. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the economy in the U.S., but also China. This is what or who we'll be talking to. We'll talk inflation with the governor of Italy, Mr. Ignacio Visco. And then we'll also be speaking with the St. Louis Fed President, James Bullard, and the Chicago Fed uh, President is coming up as well. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, there's uh, quite a lot going on in the markets. And of course, the big one is inflation. The ECB giving the green light to a multi-year project to create a digital version of the euro, an electronic equivalent of banknotes and coins. The digital euro will likely be similar to an account that euro area citizens can keep at the central bank rather than the commercial in bank. Well, the initiative comes as the European Central Bank also seeks a way to meet a growing demand for digital payments, as well as tackling a boom in cryptocurrencies. Well, joining us now uh, from Banca d'Italia is the governor and ECB governing council member. He's Ignazio Visco, of course, fresh out of a very successful G20 that was held in Venice, Italy. Governor, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. I want to talk about growth. I want to talk about inflation and the G20. Did you come out? First of all, congratulations on the G20. Uh, Venezia was beautiful, as always. Did you come out of Venice G20 actually feeling a bit more optimistic or a bit more worried about the path forward for the global economy? Well, yes, it was. Uh, first of all, it was a good meeting. I think a lot of results, notwithstanding some criticism which I read recently. But uh, I think uh, the assessment on the recovery was uh, a confirmation of what we expected in April. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a recovery which is uh, getting pace, but it is not uh, homogeneous across the world. There are a number of countries who are still lagging behind. Uh, it is uh, um, very much dependent on the speed at which the vaccination campaign is taking place. Uh, it is also f full, less than complete as a recovery. So we, we think that it will take still uh, about a, a year before we really are, are out uh, if uh, a number of conditions take place. One is uh, the obvious, and that is uh, the ability of countering a third wave, if you want, uh, of the infections. Uh, then, uh, uh, really, the pace of uh, demand at the world level has to be maintained as it is. Monetary conditions, financial conditions have to remain favorable, uh, even if we have signs of some uh, price increases that are above the targets that all central banks have set. So, Governor, we also um, caught up with uh, the ECB president earlier this week, and we had a conversation about your very important meeting on July 22nd. What exactly do you think will come out of it? Can we see a policy shift after the strategic review? Well, May 22nd uh, is uh, one of the meetings on monetary policy that we have every six weeks. Uh, obviously, it comes after 
the decisions that we took uh, on the revision of our monetary policy strategy. So it will be uh, seen in that frame. Uh, it, what we are observing now is a situation basically uh, in line with our expectations. Uh, there is uh, an agreement uh, that we really have to maintain very favorable financing conditions for a long period. We, there are two risks that we have to avoid. The first is, uh, or to counter, the first is not making mistakes ourselves. So uh, clearly we have to uh, avoid, uh, say, tapering uh, before the time c comes that we are really confident that we are back where we should. And the second is really if there are some um, exogenous shocks, market developments that would push, say, interest rates uh, on the upside in a situation in which there is still a substantial slack in the economy in, in the euro area, then we really have to show that we are determined. And we have just said that in our uh, revision of the strategy, that when we are close to the lower bound, which is a, a, a level below yeah. which interest rates really cannot go without having very negative consequences, then we must have a much more forceful uh, and uh, protracted or uh, monetary policy stance that uh, convince basically the markets at, uh, of our determination and that uh, may even imply uh, a moderate and temporary period of higher uh, uh, inflation below uh, above the, the target that we have. Yeah. So, so, Governor, given what you've just said, <clears throat> if we look um, to the autumn, is it likely that we'll need an extension of PEP? Well, we have not discussed that. And uh, I understand that there are a number of uh, um, declarations made outside the Governing Council, but this is something that we have to discuss in the Governing Council. Uh, what, as, as I said before, uh, we need to maintain uh, financing conditions uh, uh, absolutely favorable to further recovery. At the same time, uh, I only want to remember, that, to remind that the PEP uh, had, uh, was a set of emergency measures that were introduced in March last year, basically to counter the um, higher volatility, much higher volatility and shocks uh, in a fragmented uh, market uh, condition. And at the same time, however, it was also uh, part of the whole strategy of, uh, uh, for us, uh, going back to the aim of 2% uh, in, in, the, in the rate of inflation. Uh, we are still uh, behind that, that uh, below the, the 2%, uh, even if in the recent months, because of temporary effects, uh, we are close to 2% on average, but uh, our projections are still uh, much below that for the next couple of years. So the stance has to remain. Then we have uh, to discuss Governor, how uh, so, uh, to have it. Right. And, and actually, we also have to discuss how you then transition from emergency stimulus to a more normal stimulus. How quickly could that happen? Well, the transition is, is a complicated thing that we have to uh, discuss among ourselves, but I think that uh, we have really to show to be determined. I think that at the end, uh, it is extremely important the fact that the uh, governing council uh, had uh, reached an unanimous approval of the new strategy, and the strategy sets really the pace. So uh, I don't see uh, a very complicated uh, problem on the monetary side. I, I see substantial risks on the real side. The, we still have a substantial economic slack uh, in uh, labor markets uh, still uh, have not back where, where they were before the pandemic uh, started. Um, and, but, but I think the determination and at the end also the consensus in, in, in the Council is, is pretty, pretty important. But, uh, Governor, do you expect policy to actually be normalized or tightened at a further date because of the new mandate that you were just laying out? I mean, I don't understand. What, what, what do you say? 
could you, so in could terms you of normalizing, question, do you think that will take place? Yeah, so my question I was, can... do you expect monetary policy? Do you expect monetary policy to be tightened at a later date? So, what? you know, more go basically, well, as I said, keep it looser. No, no, as I said, I don't expect monetary policy to be tightened for a long period. Uh, the, the, the issue here is how to avoid uh, really that um, the market somehow, because of uh, transmission of shocks from uh, other parts of the world, the uh, U.S. clearly is, is now uh, having a recovery which is much faster than, than Europe and the inflation rate is, is much higher. I mean, we have really to avoid that this takes place in, 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 uh, in the euro area. And, uh, and this is what we, we look with care in, uh, even in our decisions on the uh, asset purchases and, uh, and, related, uh, and related measures. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, I think, uh, rather, rather necessary, and, uh, and I think we are determined to do that. The exact way, whether through PEP, whether through uh, APP, whether through in interventions in the banking sector and so on, is all uh, a set of tools that we have to discuss and agree upon. And this is uh, this will start uh, the 22nd of, uh, of this month, but it will continue in September. Uh, Governor, what does moderate overshoot for a transitory period mean to you? Is it a couple of months transitory? Is it a couple of quarters? Well, this is, uh, this is a question which we have to assess uh, case by case. Uh, it, has to do, uh, it has to be put in the perspective of the uh, projections that we, we will generate uh, uh, over a period of, of months and quarters and, and years. Uh, as, as you know, the 2% is a medium-term aim, uh, and uh, therefore we have to extract the signal from the actual data that we will observe. It will be a matter of judgment and a matter of uh, clearly uh, statistical uh, intervention. Uh, it, uh, it may be moderate for some time, uh, which means uh, quarters, which means uh, uh, the projection period uh, that we have, uh, but uh, what has to be very clear is that we are not following a model in which we are going to recover from the losses or from the, the um, actual yeah. uh, uh, observations of inflation in previous months and making up in the future. We are starting from an initial condition and we will look forward. So uh, once we will be there, we will uh, consider uh, how the projections will look, and then we will uh, judge whether they look moderate and transitory. Uh, Governor, very quickly, I know you worry about variants. What kind of, if we see uglier variants coming, what does that mean for the European recovery, and what does it mean for Italian growth? Well, I, I'm, I'm worried, obviously, from many issues that, that worry us. One thing is clearly the pandemic and the way uh, we will have to face uh, another wave uh, if, uh, if that scenario takes place uh, because of uh, the uh, also behavior that uh, our citizens have. So that may affect uh, confidence. Uh, we look. We, we are in a period in which there is a, a, a substantial, uh, uh, I'd say, confidence in, on the part of enterprises. Investment plans are there. They are most likely also uh, taking into account the changes that have been induced by uh, digitalization uh, during these uh, these very complicated years. Mm -hmm. Year, but but uh, it will not only be that. There are also the fears of consumers. Uh, we have pent up demand that has to be put back in place. And uh, and uh, for the time being, uh, while the saving rates might be is likely going down are still much higher than they, used, they, they were before the pandemic started. 
Uh, then there is foreign demand. Uh, since, as I said at the beginning, there yeah. is heterogeneity in the way the response uh, to the pandemic is taking place, then uh, for the time being we have a positive uh, view uh, about future developments, but uh, if there are, uh, say, slowdowns in the way the vaccination campaign takes place, then that may affect our economy too. Governor, thank you so much. As always, the Banca d'Italia governor and ECB governing council member Ignazio Visco. We'll have plenty more on the markets next. This is Bloomberg. Staying vigilant, Jay Powell says the Fed is ready to take action if prices get too hot, that it's too early to pair back stimulus. He faces more questions from the Senate today. In Europe, ECB board member Nieto Visco tells us that the central bank must avoid premature tapering. His colleague Isabel Schnabel warns that inflation may return quicker than expected. And player two enters the game. Well, Bloomberg learns that Netflix is planning a push beyond TV and film. The company hires a former EA executive to lead its efforts into video gaming. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lachman, London. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition on this Thursday, July 15th. Now, there is quite a lot going on in the markets. Time also for our big take. And money managers in the States couldn't stop the march towards exchange-traded funds. So instead, they actually decided to join in. Well, what was once a march was has now turned into a stampede. The ETF industry is in the U.S., is actually preparing to shatter an annual record with several months still left of the year. At $483 billion and counting, they'll likely break the near $500 billion record set in 2020 in weeks, possibly days. Within that surge, there seems to be a capitulation by the mutual fund industry of historic proportions. Now, you can read today's Big Take on typing NI Big Take Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. Joining us now to talk about inflation, to talk about his investment strategy is Benjamin Melman. He's Global Chief Investment Officer at Edmond de Rothschild Asset Management. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us on surveillance on such an important day, post-Powell, post-BOE. And of course, we have that wonderful story on ETFs. Do you play into ETFs at all? Is it something that you think will grow in the markets? Or do you prefer to play indices and stock pick? Well, actually, ETF, of course, is a very important part of the management. But as you know, we dealing with market, we, we, we try to achieve a long-term performance. We want to beat the markets. And of course, that's what ETF are not doing. So ETF is part of the management, but it's a tool, not a final goal, in my view. What kind of, Benjamin, regime shift, if any, are you expecting from the Fed and central banks? And is this what's underpinning some of the market worries that we see and some of the things that you absolutely need to get right? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Actually, in our view, we are living the best of the world, which was flooding liquidities and uh, accelerating growth. And we are slowly going to a new universe mm -hmm. where growth is speaking. And as we know, we are expecting the moment, the day, so it might not be today if we heard well what Mr. Paul said yesterday, but the day the Fed will announce the tapering for next year. So we will have less liquidity, slowing world growth. It will be a different universe, less bullish for risky assets, probably more volatility. It's not a bearish environment. It's a new environment. We are living the best of the world. So, Benjamin, I know you like European equities and Japanese equities. Is that on valuation? Yeah, well, usually when we see a strong growth, even if world growth should decelerate somewhat, we know that U.S. equities are not the outperformers usually, even if growth comes from the U.S. as it is the case again. Um, so we think that we, we need to remain on cyclical plays with more attractive valuations. We need to have also more balanced portfolio construction on equities with value, growth, equity, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, quality, sorry. And therefore, we think that being overweight Europe and uh, Japan is a good way to keep a, lev a leverage on the, the world recovery and being more balanced in terms of size. 
Benjamin, overall, when are you expecting correction? And in the lead up to a possible correction, are you expecting quality of volatility over the summer into autumn? Well, it's very difficult, to be honest, to call a, a correction. We think that the environment will be more prone to volatility when the Fed announces the tapering, when the market will pay more attention to liquidity and the timing of the first rate hikes and the number of rate hikes. So far, we have seen the case with the very strong CPI data. It's not the case. We are still in a benign neglect mood. But when the Fed announces tapering, the environment will become more fragile, and therefore any bad inflation surprise, any bad news could have more impact on the market, which so far has not been the case. So we might see more volatility. We do not expect a correction by the year end. Maybe next year will be more challenging. Um, Benjamin, can you talk to me a little bit about bonds as well? Is there anything in bonds that you would be buying right now? Well, to be honest, bonds are quite expensive right now. As we discussed, yields are very low. Ten year, US 10 years rates are, are so low. French yields are at, at are zero. So it's very difficult to, to, to have some decent returns and spreads are tight. Anyway, so we, we, we in our asset allocation are on the way to fixed income. But we see some values in European financial debt, which is still having some spreads and very strong fundamentals, but also on high yields some below average maturities. Um, Benjamin, what's your outlier call? Is there anything out there? I don't know whether it's something in a currency pair or whether it's a part of the industry that you think is unloved, whether it's travel and leisure, that you think is, is a, a little bit of a bold call that you're going, you know, you're not cautious about it, that you think is actually a good deal, which not many other people saw. Well, uh, to be honest, we are, we, we are part of, uh, of the deal we are investing in. All right. Benjamin, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time today. Benjamin Melman, thank there, you very much Global Chief Investment Officer at Edmond, the Rothschild Asset Management. Now, on to some politics in Germany's Angela Merkel is in Washington, D.C. to meet with President Biden in what may actually be her last trip as chancellor to the U.S. Over the course of her 15 years leadership of Germany, she has crossed paths with four different U.S. presidents. And while she may find President Biden an easier ally than previous U.S. leaders, key differences between the two nations still exist. Likely to be on the discussion table, the U.S. opposition to Nord Stream 2 and trade tariffs put in under the previous administration. So let's discuss all of this with Bloomberg's Berlin Bureau Chief, Birgit Jenin. Birgit, uh, great to have you on the program today. So what are the chances, first of all, on an agreement between the US and Germany on Nord Stream 2? Well, we do hear from Washington that uh, uh, until the last minute, no breakthrough has yet been achieved. Um, discussions have been difficult sort of for weeks and, and months. Um, Germany, while is, is willing to give some concessions in terms of setting up a hydrogen industry in the Ukraine, but it, it is not yet willing to make concessions in terms of actually paying kind of co um, paying and uh, giving straight aid to the Ukraine to compensate for, for the loss of the, of the gas flow. And also another big issue, a stumbling block, is uh, I kind of guaranteed that uh, Germany would stop uh, Russian gas uh, transition um, if there is a new uh, conflict in Eastern Europe. So um, the question is really how far will Merkel go and is willing to make um, concessions uh, to, to the Biden administration to get the relationship with the U.S. on a new grounding? So, Birgit, how much of the other conversation will, of course, be on travel? So it seems that European Union leaders are now really fed up with the fact that the U.S. still won't allow Europeans to go to their country. Um, you, you mean in terms of uh, the corona crisis? Well, I, I, I do think this is uh, going to come up. But, I mean, let's be honest. Also, the Europeans are, again, tightening the border controls. Um, it's, um, you know, we, we see in the, in the high season of, 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 of uh, tourism that also the Baleares, uh, Spain is being closed down or tightened again. So I don't think this is going to be a major issue of contention between Germany and the U.S.
All right, Birgit, thanks so much. Birgit Jenner there, Bloomberg's Berlin bureau chief, the very latest on Angela Merkel's visit to the White House. Coming up, we talk about Netflix uh, with a big gamble away from films and TV, also going into gaming. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro will remain hospitalized in Sao Paulo after being diagnosed with a partial intestinal obstruction. Doctors have ruled out emergency surgery. That's for now. He had been moved to the hospital after suffering with abdominal pain after 10 days of hiccups. And in Japan, the Olympics are still set for a July the 23rd opening ceremony. This week, the central government reimposed a state of emergency over the pandemic in Tokyo, and a large block of the Japanese public wants the games called off. Despite this, Tokyo's governor, Yuriko Koiki, told Bloomberg that she sees the virus-delayed games becoming a beacon of hope for the world, and she says they are prepared. Yeah, Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, in a Bloomberg scoop, we can reveal that streaming giant Netflix is actually bra branching out and producing video games. It'll be entering a crowded marketplace, competing with the likes of Nintendo and Sony. Well, Netflix is tapping former EA and Facebook executive Mike Verdu to lead the effort in a move it hopes will differentiate it from its stream servicing peers. Well, joining us now is our Bloomberg opinion tech columnist. He's Alex Webb. Alex, great to have you on the program. So why is Netflix doing this? What's the motivation behind it? Well, we're increasingly seeing that, you know, tech companies, you might think they're in, you know, film or, or, or TV shows and others are in um, social networking. Actually, they're all just in a competition for our time. And we've seen that growth at Netflix, particularly in its home market, is stagnating a little bit. It's therefore trying to get more into the space of companies like Fortnite and, and Amazon with Twitch and compete on those fronts. Uh, it's sort of there's longing questions about what the next act was going to be, whether it's going to be advertising, perhaps this, I think, looks like it's the answer. And that's their, their play to continue the growth story. So what impact are we likely to see from this on other streamers? Do we expect similar moves from them? Well, there only is actually we kind of will Netflix in a sense responding to what others are doing. You know, Apple has TV Plus, but it also has Apple Arcade, which is a you know subscription video game service, admittedly just for mobile games. We're seeing Google has Google Stadia. It also has YouTube. Amazon has Twitch, which is a way of watching video games at least. It also has Amazon Prime. So, in a sense, it is innovative, perhaps in the way they're going to present it, because it seems like it's just going to be um, another option alongside the shows they already have, but. In another sense, it is a response to the existing competition they have. Alex, overall, does it, I mean, does it actually put some of these streamlining companies in a bad place? Or is there something a, a little deeper into why they want to go this? Are, are they desperate for more revenue to have a more balanced portfolio, as it were? I mean, it is just the hunt for growth. You know, at this stage, I think everybody, it increasingly looks like everybody who wants Netflix in, you know, developed economies like, or developed for Netflix, like, like the US, they already have it. And, and then you start to worry, well, are you going to keep those subscribers or are they going to churn out and decide, actually, they've seen every show they want to see on Netflix, they're actually going to go to HBO Max or Disney Plus or somewhere else. So if you have video games, perhaps people play them for longer. You know, you don't necessarily need just to have an hour's worth of content. And when you've watched that, you move on. You can play the same game for hours and hours and hours and hours. So it perhaps builds stickiness with your existing customers and, and discourages them from, from quitting for, for rival services. Alex, thank you so much. Our quick take reporter, Alex Webb. Now, coming up, 
The EU announces quite a lot on climate change, uh, its net zero plans, but member states are already arguing over who will foot the bill. So can Europe actually afford to be the first carbon neutral continent? We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. What we did today is in tandem with what I'm doing with financial services. So this Fit for 55 package is about updating legislation because we have higher ambition for 2030, nine years uh, away, so very soon. And what we're doing on the financial side is making sure that the financial system goes or looks green, but also finances green. So we've had a number of measures, including disclosures, uh, a European taxonomy of what is sustainable economic activities. Um, and last week we had this uh, transition strategy because we want to be more inclusive, global. And also a key point for me is that the financial system itself is subject to real instability because of climate change. So we're looking at how do we factor all of these risks into the financial system. Now, today's discussion, I've just come from a really busy college meeting, was on this package, as you've referenced. Um, and look, what we all need to understand, wherever you are, that if you believe that climate change is real and you know that time is short, you can't say, yes, I want to change, but just not now. Don't ask me, ask a friend. All of us have to change. So it's not an easy message, but my message to the financial system since I took over this role here is quite a severe one because the financial system has the capacity to give us the resources to do all of this change. Firstly, by investing in what is green today, but also investing in the transition and maybe looking at some of those investments that are not sustainable and perhaps turning away from them because we need, if you like, those three pathways. And for me then, it's how do I identify for the financial system what is economically sustainable? What am I asking of corporates, large and small, to do? And what I say in a simple way is look at our taxonomy, which does identify what is sustainable, as a management tool. So if you're not sustainable today, but you want to be in business in 20 years' time, you've got to work on the sustainability agenda, whether you're large or small. So in a way, there's a lot of pieces of our, um, if you like, jigsaw coming together on the financial side and on the legislative side. But it's a lot to take in. And I, I really, when we're talking to citizens and business, it's to try and reassure people that we're we're not doing this without being sensitive to the consequences socially, politically, etc. But in one sense, to state very clearly, we don't have a choice. We have made legal commitments to reduce emissions and to be climate neutral by 2050. I hope to be around for 2030 to achieve those targets. I'm not sure about 2050, but I will have family who will be around. And I want to make sure that the world is fit for purpose by that time. Well, that was uh, Mairead McGuinness, Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability, and of course the Capital Markets at the European Commission. She spoke to me yesterday at the Bloomberg Sustainability Business Summit on Green Financing. Now, as the EU announced its path to net zero, the political fallout is already beginning. Poland, for example, wants its EU partners to pay the bill for weeding the country off coal, whilst France is resisting the drive towards electric vehicles. Well, the plan would see the continent cut emissions by 55% in the next decade, with total carbon neutrality by 2050. Joining us now live from Brussels is our European correspondent Maria Tadeo. Maria, uh, first of all, good morning. Second, it does seem like hitting these targets will definitely be a challenge, but we've also heard from the EU that there's actually no turning back. So how will they achieve those ambitions? Yes, Francine. And, you know, in your interview that we just uh, played, that message was very clear. The time is very short. We're looking at a reduction of 55 percent by 2030. That is nine years from now. Yesterday, the head of the European Commission also repeated uh, that line. The fossil fuel economy has reached its limits and we need to move forward. Now, Francine, again, this is touching basically every pillar in the European economy, from the pricing of carbon to the emissions, but also energy efficiency. And, of course, it's not going to impact every country the same way for Eastern European countries. This is a huge leap forward. And of course, we also had that reaction yesterday from a number of industries, the airline sector, the maritime sector, the shipping sector, saying this is uh, perhaps too quick. But it's also interesting that when I spoke to Franz Timmerman, the man behind this, I asked him how much leeway for negotiations is there. And this is what he had to say. Let's take a look. We believe this can be done. 
And they should understand that um, meeting our goals of uh, at least 55% reduction in eight and a half years' time is a legal obligation. And that was Franz Timmermans uh, speaking to us right after he announced uh, the Green Deal package. It is, uh, however, worth noting, Francine, that the one area in which uh, he did say Europe has to listen and cannot repeat the mistakes of the past is the social impact that this can have. You know, we've seen it that perhaps going too green at times for the working class communities across Europe is something that they are affected by in their bills and the amount of money that they have to pay, but they don't fully see the benefits reflected in their yeah. everyday lives. That was something that Franz Timmermans told us we cannot repeat those mistakes of the past. So, Marie, also on pricing, Europe is proposing a, car, a border carbon tax. How will it actually work? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, something that we were expecting, uh, and we now know it will be official, and it will affect uh, steel, cement, fertilizers, and aluminum. And, you know, this is something that Europe says should not be considered a tax, but essentially it will be a levy on imports from heavily polluting industries into the European Union. The concern is that it could trigger a green trade uh, war to some extent, but the EU does say that it will be WTO compliant, and that if anything, Francine, the rest of the world should follow paths, that they should compete on the upper bound on cutting emissions and being greener, not wanting to pollute more somewhere else. So again, whether that triggers or not, tensions remains to be seen, but the EU says that it will be 100% WTO compliant. Maria, thanks so much. I'm Marie Tadeau there, our European correspondent live from Brussels. And uh, Maria and I actually will be on Twitter. I know you work so hard, Maria, I'm actually having an espresso to your health. Uh, let's look at the markets. Stocks and futures are actually a little bit mixed after we had some data out of China that was pretty encouraging, but we also had some various inflation reports, not only from Jay Powell yesterday, but also from various governors, for example, in Europe. So I'm looking at U.S. stock index futures, mixed European equities actually falling. Investors, again, assessing a growth slowdown in China, but it wasn't as bad as some people are expecting. And also some dovish comments from the Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell. China's second quarter growth actually slowed largely in line with expectations. And then the other thing I'm watching is quite a lot of earnings. Our big take is is also on something that's quite interesting, which is ETFs, the fact that in the first seven months of 2021, there were more people going into ETFs than in the previous years. And uh, WTI, the futures are tumbling below $73 a barrel on expanding U.S. fuel inventories. And, of course, the other big story is a potential OPEC plus agreement to increase supply. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Danny Berger joins me out of our London headquarters. Kaylee Lines will be in New York. This is Bloomberg. This is Europe. We still have a lot of convincing to do, but if we can get them to agree with us, then we can meet the goals. We have seen a banner year uh, in 2020 for sustainability. Uh, there is a threat of greenwashing. So if you're not sustainable today, but you want to be in business in 20 years time, you've got to work on the sustainability agenda. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. On this Thursday, July 15th, our top stories today. Powell on Capitol Hill, day two. The Fed chair gets ready for more questions on tapering and how long the economy will be stuck with higher inflation. Consumers do their part in China. Retail spending picks up as the country's economic rebound shows more balance. And Merkel's agenda in Washington, the German chancellor is likely to press President Biden about opening up the U.S. to travelers from Europe. I'm Danny Berger with Francine Lacqua in London and Kaylee Lines over in New York. Matt Miller is off all this week. And guys, epic change. That is the two words from Larry Fink over at BlackRock to describe U.S. inflation. Certainly not the tone you were trying to strike if you're Chairman Jay Powell yesterday in front of Congress. But Francine, is all of this just good news only for BlackRock employees, it means you get an 8% pay rise when you're waking up today. I mean, hey, that's, that's wage pressure right there, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's not bad at all. And actually, that goes back to the war of talent competition and actually what some of these asset mm. managers will do to attract the right talent. But on inflation, look, if we start BlackRock you know, doing the same or JP Morgan doing the same as BlackRock, maybe Bloomberg will do the same. <laughs> maybe other companies will do the same, Wouldn't but that's mind. when inflation is a problem. I have to say I really enjoyed Jay Powell yesterday uh, talking about inflation because he really tried to assure a very anxious Congress. And that's what surprised me. I, you know, Congress was really anxious about this inflation expectations. And he said, look, if it's persistent above 2% for too long, we'll do something about it. And that's probably playing out in the markets, Kaylee. Yeah, it is. It was interesting testimony on Capitol Hill yesterday, Francine. Given how political it was, Congress really pushing him on whether it's the fiscal mm. policies of the Biden administration leading to this inflation and the uh, labor shortage we are seeing in the labor market. As for what the picture looked like in Asia overnight, it was a bit of a mixed bag. You have the big underperformance coming from Japan. The Nikkei down more than one percentage point as COVID cases are getting worse in Tokyo. Outperformance, though, from Hong Kong and from China, the CSI 300 up about one and 1.4% uh, or so after that GDP data. Yes, the growth is moderating, but at 7.9%, it was roughly in line with expectations. And the fact that retail sales beat is a good sign that the recovery is actually balancing out. Now, after that data, the Chinese yuan not really going anywhere. We're sitting at 645 at the moment. And one of your big outperformers in the G10 space is the Japanese yen. We are back below 110 stronger against the dollar by about two tenths of one percent. As for what the picture looks like here in the U.S., you did have Powell sticking on message yesterday, the transitory inflation, the idea that significant uh, forward progress has not yet been made. As for what the picture looks like ahead of day two of his testimony, we're not really going anywhere in the futures market. S&P 500 futures only up about half a point at this point. We are seeing, though, some bigger movement in the bond market. The 10-year yield down almost four basis points. 1.3 percent is where we sit. Some action to note in the commodity complex as well. When it comes to oil, futures down about 1% after a decline of nearly 3% yesterday. On the one hand, U.S. supply uh, picking up to the most since May of 2020 and the UAE looking to reach a deal on output with OPEC. So all that adds up to more supply that is weighing on oil today. Gold, though, ticking higher for a third day. Uh, futures up about half of 1%. Actually, gold futures uh, now at the highest in about a month, Danny. And of course, that is as the market weighs this inflation question. Finally, redemption for gold. I mean, it's been just <laughs> underperforming chronically. The gold bugs really want to see those gains there. So probably good news. Well, when it comes to Europe, it's a negative day. We saw this big bid for big tech in the U.S., and that's bad news for these European markets just because they are so cyclically focused. So markets like the DAX, for example, in Germany, which is down half a percent today, because this is a high beta, beta sector, it's not performing well. Now, really, one of the few places that is doing better today are U.K. stocks, FTSE 100 up one-tenth of a percent, really, though, down to FX effects to currency effects. You can see the pound on the bottom of my board here, cable at 138.43. That weaker pound giving up some of yesterday's gains over those inflationary concerns in the UK, and that is lifting UK stocks. But really, throughout the entirety of the rest of Europe, what's really, really weighing on us here is this concern over the energy space. You can see the Europe stock 600 energy sector down 2.3 percent. That's its worst daily performance in three months. You have, as you pointed out, Kaylee, those lower oil Oil prices certainly weighing on things, but it's not just oil, it's earnings as well. So this is Siemens Energy, their renewable energy company. Their shares down eight and a half percent because that commodity picture of rising prices is really weighing on their earnings, giving a warning today that their profits will be crimped because of those higher prices. So guys, whether inflation is transitory or not, it in real time is affecting companies and their profits. So that means what we seek in this market are safe havens. So this is the dollar versus the Swiss franc. It's red because the dollar uh, is lower versus the franc, the franc outperforming, which of course is a haven currency. Francine, of course, we always have to explain these pairs when the dollar is in front yep. because that's what Matt Miller would do if he was here. So <laughs> I will too. <laughs> ah, Matt Miller. Yeah, always <laughs> with us in spirit. Danny, I don't know what you started. I have like four traders, like three analysts saying, where's my 8% increase? And I am told by reliable <laughs> sources that the mood indeed at BlackRock is uh, pretty buoyant this morning after that. They have to wait until September, increase. Francine. It's, it's September when they get it. <laughs>
there you go, the, after the summer months <laughs> so that they get yep. back to work in full swing, especially if they're here in Europe. Now, this is what else we're looking at today. First of all, coming up, this is at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. Morgan Stanley reports earnings that follows results from major Wall Street rivals that have failed to excite investors. Then at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, it's day two of the Fed Chair Jay Powell's congressional testimony. This time, he's up before the Senate Banking Committee. And then a little bit later on, also the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, we know, heads to the White House for a meeting with President Biden. Tensions over Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline will probably certainly be on the agenda, as is travel from Europe to the U.S. But first, let's get to, to the data out of China. It's central to the price action and recovery story today. Second quarter GDP slowing, as expected, an upside surprise uh, for June retail sales. So to talk about this is our chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Kern, Enda, I guess what the market is also looking at after the wobble of PBOC needing or saying that the economy maybe needed a bit of extra support is that now it seems to be steadying. Yeah, exactly, Francine. A clear upside surprise on the key numbers today, and that will certainly calm down fears about whether or not China's recovery was slowing more than expected. You mentioned GDP for the second quarter came in around 7.9%, just below expectations. But a big takeaway was the numbers for June. We saw upside surprises for investment, for industrial output, and of course, retail sales. And that was a key one to look at because retail sales has been the missing part of the jigsaw so far. We saw a big uptick in spending on restaurants and catering, for example, that does suggest consumers are finally getting out and about more. We know that the trade side of things continues. Exports remain strong. I guess the question is, how long can the good, these good figures remain? There's an expectation now that activity will slow over coming months, especially on the trade side, and that perhaps consumers might pull in their horns too. So the numbers are pretty good for now. I think the, there's more of a question mark about where China's economy goes over the coming months. Enda, thank you so much. Enda Curran there with the very latest on Chinese data. Let's also turn to what's happening in D.C. Angela Merkel heading to the White House for a meeting with Joe Biden later today. Some key transatlantic differences remain, and that's mainly on Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, of course, on travel to and from Europe. Our Bloomberg White House correspondent, Anne-Marie Hordern, joins us now from D.C. Anne-Marie, so good to speak to you. What will be the more thorny issue? I mean, I guess on Nord Stream 2 it will be difficult to see the two leaders see eye to eye. Yeah, and we're just hearing now, Francine, that there will be no concrete decision regarding Nord Stream 2 from this visit with Angela Merkel. You know, the past few weeks, we've seen a lot of German officials come through Washington. I spoke with Altmaier, who is a confidant of Angela Merkel, the chancellor. I spoke to the finance minister, Olaf Scholz, and everyone was quite mute about what to expect on Nord Stream 2. But as Secretary of State Tony Blinken said, it's fate to complain. The, the pipeline is done. It's going to be finished by the end of August. What the Biden administration would like to get out of Germany is some sort of acknowledgement that they could try to help Ukraine in terms of economic and national security interests when it comes to Russia. Because having Nord Stream 2 means less gas at some point is going to have to flow through Ukraine, which economically they really rely on those transit fees to get to Europe, and it's going to go right to the uh, under the Baltic Sea, right to the German port. So this is something that has really bipartisan support in Washington and the Biden administration, this is going to be likely the biggest focus on this trip. Well, Anne Marie, while we're talking about Russia, that brings me to OPEC Plus. I'm going to ask you to put your OPEC reporter hat on as well for just a second. This deal with the UAE, what does it mean? basically just means that the UAE has a higher baseline. So right now under the current agreement, they're pumping some 3.2 million barrels a day. They're trying to get closer to 3.8. The UAE has spent and ADNOC has spent billions of dollars. They are they have been expanding their production capacity. They now have a Murban contract. They want to flex their muscles and they want to pump more oil and gas at this moment. Uh, it looks like they are going to get a deal. There are still background negotiations going on. I would never call an OPEC deal and until we see it officially <laughs> done. But the travel of direction looks like there will be some sort of agreement. I would say look to the others. If the UAE and the Emiratis are now getting a higher baseline, who's next? I can bet you that Baghdad is now also saying, well, you know what, it's time we pump a little bit more too. And Marie, never too far from an oil chart and an oil story. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordern. Now, looking at Netflix, which aims to make a push beyond just movies and TV shows, Bloomberg has learned the streaming service is aiming to expand into video games, hiring former electronic arts and Facebook executive Mike Verdu to lead the effort. For more on Netflix, we have Alex Webb, Bloomberg opinion columnist, joining us. So, Alex, 
Are gamers really going to be willing to turn away from their EA favorites, your FIFAs, and, and instead sign up for Netflix to play games? I, I'm not sure that they're going to be turning away. It's really about ensuring that people who already subscribe to network, Netflix stay subscribed to Netflix, and perhaps that other people who maybe already use EA games add it. Um, this is a problem Netflix has had that, A, their growth in the U.S. is starting to stagnate a little bit, and B, they are having higher churn. People have kind of seen the shows that they want to see on Netflix and then starting to look elsewhere. Increasingly, we're seeing that you're not just competing with other companies who make films or TV. You are competing generally with other content makers. And Netflix is kind of making this explicit by making this push, by competing with Fortnite and, of course, then with Twitch, which is owned by Amazon. By the same token, we've already seen that Amazon with Twitch is getting into the gaming space. Apple, of course, it has Apple TV+, Plus, but it also has Apple Arcade, which is a subscription gaming service. Mm -hmm. Google has YouTube, also has Arcade, um, has Stadia. So this is a new play from Netflix, but it's something that's already playing out through the industry. All right, Bloomberg Opinion columnist Alex Webb, thank you so much. And Netflix is higher by about 2% in pre-market trading, but there are some other stocks on the move I want to point to. One of them moving to the upside is actually Blackstone. The private equity giant has reached an agreement to buy uh, some AIG insurance and housing assets for $7.3 billion. The stock is up about 4% on that news. Another stock moving to the upside on no real tangible news is CureVac, of course, the would-be COVID-19 vaccine maker. But the stock has fallen about 14% on the week through yesterday's close. So maybe it's just a little bit of dip buying. It's up about 3.6%. To the downside, though, the original poster child for meme stock mania, the euphoria seems to be ending. GameStop lower for 3%, actually heading for its fifth down day in a row. From its most recent peak in June, Francine, the stock is down about 47%. So uh, GameStop, maybe the Reddit traders turning a little sour on it, Francine. Yeah, Kaylee, I feel like we need to become gamers between Netflix going into games and GameStop <laughs> and all of that. We'll look into it and we'll find someone who can explain how we do gaming in the 21st century. Coming up, Matt Maley, Miller Tabak, Chief Market Strategist. And then a little bit later, we'll also hear from Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute. I don't know whether we'll talk about wage increases, but we'll certainly talk about inflation and ETFs. This is Bloomberg. Inflation has increased notably and will likely remain elevated in coming months before moderating. Inflation is being temporarily boosted by base effects as the sharp pandemic-related price increases from last spring drop out of the 12-month 12 12 -month calculation. When we are close to the lower bound, which is a, a, a level below which interest rates really cannot go without having very negative consequences, then we must have a much more forceful uh, and protracted or uh, monetary policy stance that uh, convince basically the markets at, uh, of our determination and that uh, may even imply uh, a moderate and temporary period of higher uh, uh, inflation below, uh, above the, the target that we have. Uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell and the Bank of Italy Governor Ignazio Visco talking inflation there. Of course, a lot of the focus on the markets is not only on inflation, but on the data coming in from China. Talking about the markets now, Matt Maley, Chief Market Strategist at uh, Miller Tayback. Matt, thank you for joining us. A lot of focus, of course, on inflation, a lot of focus on uh, the worries that Congress had yesterday with day one of that Jay Powell testimony. When you look at when we could find out, given all the variants and the concerns out there on growth as well, when we found out whether inflation really takes hold. Is it now a problem that's been pushed back to November, December of this year? Well, it's certainly something uh, that Chairman Powell is trying to, is himself is trying to, to push back. It's, it's so hard. It, it's kind of interesting because one of the things he did say yesterday was that it's, you know, it's basically impossible to know, uh, to, to judge what, what commodity prices, uh, are, where, which way they're going to go over the next few months uh, and over the near term. Well, uh, that, which is basically admitting he doesn't really know, uh, uh, what, you know, how, how inflation is going to go over the next few months. So the, the, the risk we take is that, that we do shoot to the upside. I guess my point is that, uh, 
uh, we've moved out of these emergency situation when, when you know this massive uh, stimulus program that the Fed has, has created uh, was was needed because the the economy was an emergency, the right. markets were an emergency, they had completely shut down, and now they uh, now we're out of that. I mean, to taper back is a lot different than raising interest rates. So uh, I, I think that if they, if they make a policy mistake, it's by uh, letting inflation run too hot because at, at, at some point uh, they're going to have to snap it down very quickly. You know, remember yeah, back Matt. in 2000, late 2018. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you, you speak of inflation running too hot. We got some hot prints this week, and let, yet I'm looking at a 10-year yield at 1.3%. Does that make sense to you? Well, I mean, if the, you know, it, it doesn't because, uh, uh, you know, but but the, the market isn't really running the, the show right now. It's the Fed because they're again they're they're uh, keeping this kind of emergency level of stimulus in in the marketplace, and uh, it's artificially keeping interest rates low. I mean, we I think we all know that the uh, their stimulus is is the thing that's keeping these interest rates as, as low as they are, uh, and uh, you know that's great for a while, but we chance we, we run the risk of, of of not just overshooting and, and, and having a, a big problem with inflation. We also uh, a risk. Uh, a, a risk, uh, a, I'm sorry, an asset bubble, a stock market bubble, and uh, with the way the, the leverage is in the system, a uh, uh, pricking of that bubble will be uh, cause more problems than 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 they'll uh, you know, than, than that would to do if they okay. if they didn't do anything. So you mentioned a stock market bubble. Let's go there, Matt. Uh, you have small caps year to date now underperforming big tech. Is that going to be the way it is for the rest of the year? Do we just need to chase that FOMO fang trade until things somehow normalize out? Well, I mean, uh, there, there's... I don't think so. I think that we're going to return back to a, a move higher in interest rates because I do think that one of the reasons that the interest rates came down was because everybody was caught off sides in a positioning situation uh, in terms of the, everybody wanted to look, were, were, was betting on a, uh, a, a steepening of the yield curve. Now I think a lot of that that that. Uh, Position has been unwound, as we just talked about. I mean, inflation is is getting higher. The the data is not getting much weaker. We've seen you know periods here and there where they're missing expectations, but growth is still there. So I think interest rates are going to come back and move higher. And uh, that, that when that happens, I think you're going to return to the uh, the value trade versus the growth trade. And uh, you look on a technical side of things, these uh, these tech stocks are getting very very overbought. You look at a stock like Nvidia, which is a great great company, uh, but very very overbought on a near term basis. So I don't want to be chasing some of these uh, big cap names. Um, Matt, would you be chasing some of the travel and leisure? Are they back now that it seems that a lot of economies are reopening and unlikely that we'll go back into a full lockdown? Yeah, I mean, like anything else, these stocks got a little ahead of themselves, so I think they're a great opportunity to buy them on their most current weakness. I mean, they, they just, they, they, you know, they, they shot up in the spring and in, in early summer here, uh, and so they've come down a little bit. I think that's healthy. I mean, you see some of these airlines starting to come come down. Uh, I think that's a good opportunity because uh, I just don't see people, especially in the airlines, the cruise lines may be a little bit tougher, uh, but uh, to go back to what we saw, uh, you know, in the in the winter and spring of this year, people are just not going to do it. They, they, they're just They'll do whatever it takes to be able to get out, uh, whether it be more uh, mm -hmm. vaccines or, or, or be willing to wear a mask again. That's fine. But I don't, I don't see a big lockdown again. All right. We have to leave it there. But thank you so much for waking up early for us this morning. Matt Maley, Chief Market Strategist at Miller Tabak. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua and Danny Berger in London. Matt Miller is off today. Now let's get the first word news. And South Korea is trying to move up its spot in the global space race. The country's science minister says this means launching satellites on homegrown, ro homegrown rockets and eventually a mission to the moon. The reason for moon exploration is because we expect it to be utilized in the future for not only national defense and the public sector, but the economic sector as well. In that sense, we believe we have to actively take part in the Artemis program in order for such cooperation to take place smoothly. South Korea saw limits removed on its rocket development earlier this year when the U.S. lifted restrictions in a bilateral agreement. 
The Biden administration is extending a Trump-era halt to economic dialogue with China. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's team is in touch with Chinese counterparts, but there are no plans to restart high-level talks. And Fed Chair Jay Powell says it's too early to scale back aggressive support for the economy. That's what he told the House Financial Services Committee. Of course, he's back on Capitol Hill today, and we will discuss that with Wei Li of the BlackRock Investment Institute next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Frontline Life with Danny Berger in London, Katie Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. Now, a lot of the focus, of course, is on the markets. Uh, Danny, we look at China, we look at inflation, and I know you're looking also at wage pressures on the upside. I certainly am. And look, it's this strange dichotomy where we're hearing anecdotally that there are wages are rising. Of course, BlackRock and the 8% wage uh, increase come September is one of them. But if you look at the NFIB survey from out earlier in this week, Francine, yes, they see prices at all time highs. Yes, they see the need for hiring that those vacancies, that pressure at all time high highs. But yet we're not seeing that wage inflation increase yet. Joel Francine certainly thinks that the wage picture will be fixed once some of the unemployment benefits start to get scaled back. Yeah, so we look at that. And it, what's interesting, Kaylee, is also uh, speaking to our Laura Cooper, she actually believes that if you look at Treasury and some of the bonds, they're, they're following dollar movement more mm. than anything that came out of Jay Powell. That's actually really interesting, Francine, because I've been pretty confused by the action we've seen in the bond market this week, given how hot the inflation prints are. And yet, at the long end of the curve, we're actually seeing a bid. And that is true today as well. In the stock market, though, we're seeing a little bit of weakness, especially in Europe. The stock 600 is falling for a second day. Right now, it's down about four tenths of 1%. And here in the U.S., ahead of Jay Powell on Capitol Hill day two, as well as Morgan Stanley earnings coming up a bit later on, futures are now in negative territory, down about five points on S&P E-minis. The bond market, though, as I was saying, we are seeing a bid into the long end of the curve. The 10-year yield down three basis points, one3 one percent is where we sit uh, and keeping an eye on oil today as well. Of course, you have more supply here in the U.S. plus the UAE looking to reach a deal on output with OPEC plus more supply. Not necessarily music to the oil market's ears right now. WTI crude is trading around seventy two dollars a barrel. And of course, that is weighing on the energy sector in particular, both in Europe and here in the U.S. When you look at pre-market trading, you have E&Ps like EOG Resources, ExxonMobil, each down the better part of 2%. And the energy select sector spider, which of course is a good gauge on how the sector as a whole will be performing come the opening bell, looks like it will indeed underperform with that down about a six tenths of 1% in early hours. One stock moving to the upside, though, is Netflix. No longer will you just have to binge watch TV and film uh, using the streaming service. You also, in the future, probably are going to be able to play video games, Danny. So that stock is up about three tenths of 1%. My question is, is Netflix going to make its own controller? How is that going to work? You use a remote? That's a good point. But I have to say, Kaylee, if they don't make a chess kind of game, like a Queen's Gambit kind of game, I mean, they have so much IP. True. I would certainly play that. I'm not good at chess, but I could pretend I am with a Netflix game. Anyway, Kaylee, the chart I have is my first love it is ETFs. I used to be an ETF reporter, so, you know, I love a good flows chart. I also want to welcome our radio listeners as well. And for our listeners who can't see this, let me describe to you what I'm looking at. It is half-year flows into U.S. ETFs. And the very last bar I have on this chart for our listeners, it is miles above all the other flows we've seen for first half of the year. This is the best half when it comes to inflows into U.S. ETFs. That's $488.5 billion going into the sector in the first half. The record for an entire year is just above $490 billion. We have almost beat a full year record, only six months into the year. Now, this, of course, means some soul searching for money managers. And this is what our big take is on today. I really recommend anyone go out and read it from Claire Ballantyne talking about this soul searching that this move into ETFs is causing Francine. Yeah, I love ETFs. I love chess. I suck at chess. Wei Li is actually, <laughs> I think, a double gold Olympic medalist in chess. And I'm not even kidding. Wei Li, 
Yeah, Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute now joins us for a talk on the markets, on ETFs, and uh, maybe chess on, on one side. Wei, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, what is the market actually looking at? If you look at the move in ETFs in the first seven months of 2021, there's more inflows than there has been in the last past years of 12 months. So why this attraction more and more towards ETFs? Um, there is an element of um, market risk on and there is another element of ETFs being increasingly used to express that a risk on view. So if you think about so far this year, absolutely equity inflows is on track to smash record, making 2021 a record year for ETF flows um, by quite a bit of margin in comparison with previous records as we just looked at. But at the same time, we're also in an environment where we have very strong growth dynamics, above trend growth dynamics, and coupled with supportive central bank and very negative real rate. And this is a very potent mix for risk assets to uh, have done well and also continue doing well in our view, which is why going into the rest of the year, we are pro-risk. And that certainly has been borne out by the momentum that we have seen on the flow side as well. Oh, wait, how should we actually look at inflation? So three weeks ago, the market was freaking out because they saw a bit of inflation. Then we have a big inflation print, and actually they seem pretty cool about it. So it, you, what exactly is going on? What's the next? Is there a correction coming up that could be triggered by inflation? Or will they wait until later in the year to understand exactly how, you know, what it means for interest rates in 2022? We actually believe that we're entering a higher inflation regime, um, and it's driven by both near-term dynamics that have everything to do with restart, and also by uh, medium-term drivers, including supply chain shifting, including central banks' targets to want to drive inflation above target for a sustained period in order to make up for past misses, as well as this concept that we call fiscal dominance, which is that uh, as debt rises, debt to GDP ratio rises, rates cannot move too high too quickly. Otherwise, we have a debt servicing uh, issue, which is a bigger problem than, than rising inflation. And all mm -hmm. of that clears the path for inflation to push higher in the medium term, which we believe is somewhat underappreciated by market, which is why we recently upgraded a U.S. inflation-linked uh, bonds uh, at the expense of so uh, nominal bonds. There's, there's inflation kind of from the macro and monetary policy point of view, what it means for the Fed. And then there's what it means for companies. Siemens Energy today, ConAgra earlier this week. Companies are facing very real pricing pressures. How do you think about that when trying to make investments? That's a very good point. Corporate margin over the years, they have really enjoyed tailwinds, including low cost production, low labor cost, uh, as well as uh, globalization that trend uh, favoring kind of the, 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 the cost side of things and interest very, very low has also supported uh, corporate margin. But we are at a juncture where some of these uh, strong tailwinds may be stalling or maybe even moving in reverse. So what that means for companies and what that means for earnings is really, really crucial. And I think the answer lies in being selective. Uh, we're looking for companies that can pass on these costs. We're looking for companies that can continue to grow their margin, grow their earning, despite the environment that we're in. And for example, based on that mm. future technology looks uh, well positioned. Yeah, wait, you know, you're not the first I've heard talk about this balance sheet, this ability to pass on costs being important. But regardless of that, heading into this earnings season, we're just seeing this huge bid for big tech every time that T word, that transitory word gets uttered by Jay Powell. How acute right now is concentration risk in these U.S. markets? Um, well, as you mentioned earlier on, we have seen a lot of uh, inflows into uh, equity markets. And we ask ourselves this question, are some of the positions getting uh, getting crowded? Um, with regards to U.S. equity market, we have seen a lot of uh, inflows, but not to the extent that we would be worried about too stretched 
positioning leading to potential correction. And when we look at the um, same indicator and analysis that we have done for other equity uh, markets, uh, Europe, for example, emerging market, for example, where positioning actually is far from being stretched. So despite the significant uh, inflows, uh, some of them are still making up for previous uh, underweight. And we're not seeing flashing red signs, uh, red lights in terms of uh, in terms of positioning becoming too much of a, a concern that could lead to uh, too much uh, market uh, nervousness uh, at this mm -hmm. juncture. But now having said that, uh, as we head into summer well, thinner liquidity, we're increasingly hearing from clients that they watch out for that. Wei, thank you so much. As always, Wei Lee, their Global Chief Investment Strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute. Now, we'll have plenty more on inflation and some of the moves into ETFs. Also coming up, we'll hear exclusively from the Apollo co-founder and newly minted Chief Executive Officer. He's Mark Rowan, and he shares his vision for the investing powerhouse next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with the Carnival CEO, Arnold Donald. This is Bloomberg. It was definitely a noisy year, but you know, it's interesting. I did um, a little bit of a year in review for our largest investors. And I said, all right, let me characterize the last year the way I would. Assets under management up 146 billion. Record profits, 92 billion of deployment. We also hired 300 people remotely, from 1,300 people to 1,700 people, and turnover went down. So if I had told you that, you would have said, oh my God, really? Because the noise sometimes uh, just exceeds the reality of what's happening. And so imagine how well we would do without noise. Right. And yet we got to talk a little bit about the noise. The fact that you're in this job right now and sitting here talking to me as the CEO, you probably would not have anticipated a year ago. Tell me about you know how the firm is doing and feeling, how you're feeling in this you know post Leon world. You know Josh Harris, your your other co-founder, is also exiting. Help me understand what's going on. So maybe I'll, I'll put it in perspective of the industry, at least how I see it. The, the industry that we are in, the alternatives industry, everyone kind of came up the same way. You have a group of firms that started life as private equity firms. If they were really good at that, they were trusted with more capital, they got to diversify. And if they were really good at that, they got to go public. But that whole generation of firms started as private partnerships with a group of founders, of which Leon was one and the others are very well known. We will, and we are in the process of a generational shift so we've now done the entirety of generational shift at Apollo. And that means governance. That means one share, one vote. And that also means Leon stepping down from the firm at the beginning of the year and Josh stepping back at, upon the closing of the Athene deal. Now, I think every firm in our industry is going to go through this same generational shift. They likely will do it less noisily than we have. Uh, but nonetheless, we've accomplished it. So for me, this is my 36th year, uh, 31 years at Apollo, and I never had more fun. And so what is, what is the current effect tonally, internally, and externally of that, as you say, noisy transition and, and, and succession? I would say it's the elimination of obstacles. So I start with we're in a business that fortunately gets better every day. Whether we do anything positive or don't do anything positive, our business is driven by really positive forces, which makes it we're very fortunate. So whether it is demographics, whether it is generational transfer of wealth, whether it is indexification, I know not a word, but nonetheless, of markets, or just the need for return, our business is driving forward. And uh, while that's happening, there are some fascinating things taking place. FinTech revolution, democratization of finance, as well as just changes in the investment marketplace, which you noted uh, in the outset. All of that is just an amazing backdrop 
to run and guide a firm uh, in the alternative asset industry. That was CEO and co-founder of Apollo Global Management, Mark Rowan, speaking there. That's as the firm has seen its profit and assets under management surge to new highs during the pandemic. For more, Bloomberg Shanali Bosick is joining us now. Shanali, obviously the largest the one of the largest alternative asset managers yeah. and call it noise call it what you want it has mm. seen a lot of turmoil this yes. year where does that leave Apollo now? It's a pretty incredible thing to see Mark Rowan speak publicly because everybody who knows him knows that he's a man of very few words. And this is 40 minutes of an exclusive in his first time since becoming CEO of Apollo. With that said, too, he also speaks to, yes, the public perception of the firm. And also, I thought, very interesting, Kaylee, their delta to Blackstone. Apollo mm. is the biggest credit manager of its peers. Blackstone is the big, one of the biggest private equity managers, big real estate footprint. They compare compete very heavily, but Blackstone has had a bigger run up in its stock. People don't realize this, but Blackstone now is less than $15 billion in market cap away from Goldman Sachs. Mm. That's how much the private asset industry has risen in relation to the banking industry. The other thing Mark had said that I thought was interesting was that he believes their strategy will win at the end because of the lack of spread in public markets, mm -hmm. which is why you see so many hedge funds moving to privates as well. Interesting to see how much those firms uh, squeeze out the earnings at the end. Uh, Chanel, we're also expecting earnings from Morgan Stanley, yeah. but the other question is actually, if you have BlackRock saying, look, your base salary will go up by 8%, yeah. that's it. I mean, not that's it, but that's as a start for everyone. Does it just push Wall Street to do the same? We definitely see wage inflation on Wall Street almost at every level, Francine, and at the higher levels for senior bankers, uh, senior PE managers, you're also seeing people being elevated. Uh, you know, Mark Rowan was talking about the next generation. You're seeing that happen across so many firms. Interestingly, Fran, you're hearing banking executives say their biggest competition in talent is in the investing universe, given how these markets are diverging at this period of time. So I think what BlackRock is saying is just the tip of the iceberg here. Definitely interesting to hear how they're trying to entice people, be it a, a Peloton or a pay rise. Shanali, thank you so much. That's our Wall Street reporter, Shanali <laughs> Basic. Now, later today, you don't want to miss an exclusive interview with St. Louis Fed President James Bullard. That's at 8 a.m. New York time, 1 p.m. here in London. And then another Fed president later, we'll hear from Chicago's Charles Evans. That's at 11 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. We all need to understand, wherever you are, that if you believe that climate change is real and you know that time is short, you can't say, yes, I want to change, but just not now. Don't ask me. Ask a friend. All of us have to change. So it's not an easy message. But my message to the financial system, since I took over this role here, is quite a severe one because the financial system has the capacity to give us the resources to do all of this change. Firstly, by investing in what is green today, but also investing in the transition and maybe looking at some of those investments that are not sustainable and perhaps turning away from them because we need, if you like, those three pathways. And for me then, it's how do I identify for the financial system what is economically sustainable? What am I asking of corporates, large and small, to do? And what I say in a simple way is look at our taxonomy, which does identify what is sustainable, as a management tool. So if you're not sustainable today, but you want to be in business, in 20 years' time, you've got to work on the sustainability agenda. Marit McGuinness there of the European Commission speaking yesterday at the Bloomberg Sustainable Business Forum. And of course, this is on the back of a lot more targets and the transition to net zero by the EU. Now let's get straight to Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Joining us now, Tom's looking at the zero bound and of course looking at yields, 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 yields in focus, Tom. But actually, treasuries are not moving that much. Well, they're moving. It's, it's a really interesting market. We were told this would be an interesting week. Chairman Powell yeah. and others have delivered uh, the goods. Well, first of all, we're going to drive I forward the conversation this morning, Francine, an incredibly important interview our Michael McKee with James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed. I can't convey the importance of this interview. Bullard is the one that came out and said, 
we would see a regime change. If a negative real yield where it is isn't a regime change, I don't know what is. It's going to be interesting to see Bullard Powell and the idea of a new regime. Let's go to the chart. It's a negative real yield, ever more negative. This is the residual, Francine. This is the nominal yield. Think Germany, London, the gilts, whatever. Less inflation expectations. Yeah. They are ever bigger. And it gets you out to a negative real yield, which over 20, 25 years is absolutely unprecedented. Yeah, and, and Tom, I have to say that when you look at dollar, I mean, it's probably one of the most interesting currencies out there. And that's probably underpinning some of all of the stock moves and bond moves that we're seeing in the U.S. I mean, what's the next thing that dollar and treasuries are looking at? Yeah, this apart is from day two of Jay Powell. Well, you know, the day two of Jay Powell is going to be what it is. But to your point on dollar, it's, you know, horse and cart. Is the dollar moving yield? Is yield moving dollar? I would suggest yield down. Inflation expectations are moving uh, the U.S. dollar. And it's in the range, Francine, but it's very deceptive. Look where sterling is. And if sterling gives way at 138, that will be an important event. Yeah, it certainly will be an important event. So, Tom, I'm looking forward for travels to resume and you coming back to London. Maybe we'll have a drink or two of our choices at Claridge's, depending on where dollar is. Tom Keen there, co-anchor of right. Bloomberg Is either McDonald's now, or Claridge's? We don't know which. Today. I know it all depends on euro dollar or actually uh, sterling a dollar. Now, let's have a look at what else we're watching. And uh, Kaylee, you're all over Jay Powell. I'm watching Jay Powell again today, Francine. How hard do politicians push him once again on the impact of fiscal policy on inflation in the labor market? And how many times does he have to say fiscal policy is not in his wheelhouse, that that is not his job? Also, I'm interested to see if any new words are coined today because Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Democratic representative from New York yesterday, called inflation transitionatory which is one I have um, never heard before. And I'm wondering if it actually works, transitionatory, as in we're transitioning out of the pandemic economy to a post-pandemic economy. Like Danny, it. does that make sense at yeah. all? I think it does. I think the rule is, as long as you're using a T word to explain <laughs> inflation, true. it is fair game. It doesn't matter what T word it is. And add an Ori at the end. It'll work. Well, Kaylee, <laughs> I am watching OPEC+. Plus. They're out with their monthly oil report later today. This is going to be the first time we've gotten a monthly oil report for them where they give their outlook for the market since this tussle became started to go, this back and forth between <clears throat> the UAE and Saudi over UAE's desire to have an increased benchmark. It looks like like the UAE will get that, according to Bloomberg reporting. We were talking to our Anne-Marie Hordern about this earlier. The oil market reacting here down seven-tenths of a percent. But how tight is the oil market right now in the view of OPEC Plus? That's some details we'll be getting later today, Francine. Yeah, well, what I'm watching out for, if I ever recover from, of course, working from home and my, like, 15th espresso, which is not better than the Bloomberg office, I'd like to tell Tom Keene, because he always says that my, you know, home coffee so much better, is, of course, Angela Merkel in her last meeting with Joe Biden or her last travel to the White House as chancellor as she steps down in the autumn. A lot of the talk, of course, will be on Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline uh, that the U.S. has opposed for such a long time. And the other is whether EU travelers will be let in through the U.S. because of COVID. So two pretty contentious issues for the two leaders to talk about. I'll be watching that. This is Bloomberg.